like to call the uh, February 5th school committee meeting to order. Uh, thank you for everyone's continued attendance. Uh, so tonight uh, we'll, we'll start with, with public input, uh, then go to the, uh, have a vote on the consent agenda, and then uh, hopefully by 8 we'll be able to talk about the accelerated repair program, and then we'll get back into discussion on the uh, reconstruction budget. Uh, and I just wanted to... Actually, I'll wait. I'll wait to comment on on the reconstruction budget when we start that. So, if there's yep. a, uh, I'll move motion. move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second it. Is there anything anyone would like taken from that? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Six zero. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, public input. Yes. Not it's on the down. agenda. Here. Hi, Mary Jane, I'm Amy Fairchild, and I'm reading something from Rebecca Lieberman, who couldn't be here, so I'm going to her talks on my own. Yeah. School committee members and Dr. Darty, please schedule a meeting to discuss alternatives to cutting foreign language and extra English in the balanced budget. Better yet, please discuss these options tonight. This to me is far more important than discussing how to spend override money that may never materialize if the override does not pass. The mission of public schools is to educate and to approve a budget that everyone admits is bad for students and teachers while refusing to consider alternatives is failing to live up to your responsibility. Please make time to discuss alternatives to save the middle school teachers and programs. And in the future, please prioritize teachers over athletics and extracurriculars, which, while important, are not essential to the mission of education. Thank you. And again, that's from Rebecca. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Barry Berman, member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I just come here to basically, um, I want to publicly thank the school committee for attending our meeting last Tuesday as we struggled through a very difficult um, and complex um, discussion in terms of, of the override. And I, and I think that not only were you active participants, but you really added a lot of value to the process and I think helped us get us to really the right place where we uh, voted unanimously both on not just the number of what we're going to ask for but the method in which we ask so um, it was difficult it was hard um, and and you guys um, were very helpful um, to us in that process so I want to at least publicly thank you um, and now we all go and do our own things tonight you'll be try to figure out um, what's going to go in your bucket and next Tuesday um, you know we're going to from a list of 30, pare it down to somewhat less than that, and ultimately come up with a set, with a set of services that um, we're going to take forward to the voters. One thing um, I, I did send uh, an email to the chairs and co-chairs, both of this committee and my committee. Um, I think it's really important that once we sort of figure out what it is that we're really going to be asking for, not just in terms of the number, but the services that that's going to do, that we really um, be proactive in going out into the community. Um, one of the things that came up in the selectmen survey was the way that voters get information. And one of the ways that <coughs> voters get information that was the least was hearing it from their public officials. So um, I would like us to, you know, once this is all done, kind of figure out, come to get a way to, to come together so that um, we can collect go out into the community coffees, community office hours, things like that where maybe someone from the selectmen and the school committee can come together where we make ourselves available to really answer any questions that the community has. I think it's really important that um, this is going to generate a lot of questions. Um, folks are going to be looking at this really for the first time and I think it's really important that, um, that, the, that the community hears from us, not just here in this forum, but you know, maybe us being a little bit proactive. So I'm going to bring it up at my board you know obviously hopefully you would talk about it here once this is done but um, we've got a lot of work to do I'm really confident that once folks see um, why we're doing what we're doing um, they're going to come together and support the town so um, again I just wanted to thank you uh, for your participation and I look forward and I'm sure my colleagues do as well uh, to, to working with you you know toward April 3rd 
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public input? Seeing none, I'd like to do reports now. Dr. Jackson. Um, I have a um, report from a group of people who are working on a community conversation. There's going to be a pilot on Wednesday the 21st, March 21st. Um, at the library from 7 to 9. Invitations will be coming <coughs> out soon. It's going to be based on the process that many know of called the World Cafe. And so we're hoping to bring people together to talk about the questions they think we should be thinking about in the community. And um, so stay tuned. There'll be more information coming out. And I know that um, Mrs. Wilson has information on the CPAC. Thank you. No, no report. Nope. Sure, I just have a brief update. Um, I just wanted to let the committee know that we have. Um, we. Thank you. That's we have seven teachers who started an online course through the Landmark School, and six of those teachers are at Joshua Eaton, and we have one at RMHS, so they just started that, and that will be wrapping up the end of February, and then we're going to be having some on-site consultation for Joshua Eaton with the Landmark School. Um, the next CPAC meeting is February 12th at 7 o'clock downstairs, and I'm sure information will be coming out from the CPAC board on that soon. And then at our next school committee meeting, I will be providing a more detailed report out um, regarding our Department of Education mid-cycle review progress reporting, as well as updates on our progress reporting with the Office for Civil Rights. So both of those have progress reports due over the next few weeks. So at our next meeting, I'll provide a comprehensive update. Thank you. Great. No. Dr. Dark. I have a couple of things. Um, my understanding, by the way, is that the live feed for RCTV is not, the sound is not working. Um, is that true? The recording's fine. The recording's fine, but the live, so at some point, someone will hear this. Um, so a couple of things. One is, uh, just want to up to date the committee on the Reading Memorial High School principal search. The uh, screening committee has met twice now. The first time was to go over the logistics of the process um, and have discussion about the confidentiality piece. Um, the second meeting, which was held last week, was to design the questions for the interviews. Um, the, interview is, the interviews are going to be held this week. Um, we have several candidates that the, the screening committee will be interviewing um, on Thursday. Um, at this point, this is a confidential process. Um, once the screening committee moves forward a group of candidates, then I will be conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews with those candidates, and then they're called pre-finalists. Those pre-finalists will then, um, if if everything checks out with references, they'll get moved on to become finalists, and then we will have them <coughs> go through the site visit process here at the high school. All of that will probably happen after February vacation, um, the week after, so the week after will be a very busy week, and then if there are um, additional needs, we may be going on site visits to the candidates, uh, <coughs> sorry, candidates' um, schools. So that process is underway, and I want to thank the screening committee uh, for all of their work. We have a 12-member screening committee that is being led right now uh, by Jen Bovey, who's our HR administrator, and it is a mix of parents, administrators, teachers, and we do have a student um, on the committee as well. The other thing that I wanted to update the committee on is kindergarten. For next year, currently we have 317 students uh, who are enrolled in kindergarten. Our anticipation is that will continue to grow um, between now and September. Um, the census is showing that we do have some more students out there that potentially could be in kindergarten. Um, 40 of those students are half day. The rest of the students are full day. Um, we do have sufficient 
uh, class size and space for the full day students at this point. Uh, from this point forward, there will be a waiting list for any other student that would be um, enrolling in full day. The half day students are gonna be uh, placed at two schools for next year so that we can have adequate class sizes for those half day classes. Um, it will be at Eaton and at Killam. So students at Barrows and Eaton will be attending Eaton if they're in the half day program. Students at Woodend, Birch Meadow, and Killam will be attending Killam for the half day program. So more information will be going out this week. The letters are gonna be mailed tomorrow. In those letters will also be information about extended day programming. Um, so I just wanted to update the committee on that process and uh, we're excited that we have 317 kindergarten students, uh, which is higher than the last couple of years by about 30, 40 students. So um, that process is continuing. That's all I have in my reports. Mr. Chair, yeah. I just received word from RCTV uh, that the live audio fix has been fixed. And they asked me to say something. <coughs> it's what? Uh, just want to highlight for people that uh, we will be meeting with the Finance Committee on Wednesday, February 7th this week. I believe that we are posted for that meeting. So I just wanted to make sure that that will be discussion and presentation of our FY19 budget to the FinCom. The balance budget. I think it's uh, both. Dr. Doherty, I'd like to go into the uh, second reading of the uh, bullying mm -hmm. policies. So Absolutely. We wanted to make a quick presentation on that. Are you, are you doing the motion? I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, sorry. Are you doing I'll, the motion I'll do first? the motion first. Um, move to accept and approve the second reading of revised policy JIC <coughs> bullying prevention. Second. Sorry. So it seems like it's been a long time since we looked at this. Um, the um, when I think it was in December that, that we discussed this and I uh, was asked to get more information from Attorney Joyce about uh, we had uh, two different definitions of bullying. One was in the policy, one was in the bullying prevention plan. In discussions I had with Attorney Joyce, uh, Attorney Joyce felt that the definition that was in the policy would be um, the more appropriate definition um, as stated by the law. So that change has been made in both the bullying policy and um, in the bullying prevention plan. So what I've provided for you is the policy, which is the same policy that you did a reading on the last time. The bullying prevention plan, um, I left in the red line version so you could see the changes that have been made throughout this process. Um, all the other changes that were made were made when we had the first reading. I believe we had and we had at least two uh, second readings. So some of these. So this is yeah. Essentially, this is the third the reading. Some of the changes were already yeah. reviewed, actually. Yes. Is there any question, Mr. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that to the extent that a, a definition appears in either the policy or the. Um, well, particularly in the policy, but also in, is it called the handbook, the plan? I'm sorry, in, either the plan or the policy that where there is a term such as bullying or cyberbullying that is defined in the Massachusetts statute that the definitions in both the policy and the plan are the same as the definition in the statute. Can you confirm that? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? And hearing none, accept the vote. Zero. Got that one done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess at this point, uh, I'd like to move into the uh, discussion on the reconstruction budget. And I uh, just, uh, just to you know, kind of echo some of Mr. Berman's comments and public input, just to put this into context, uh, the, uh, you know, the original reconstruction budget that the school committee voted was uh, 2436000 and 
uh, you know, in the in the spirit of uh, <coughs> uh, working together and compromise, uh, we 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 felt comfortable with uh, coming down on that number uh, to the two million one thirty seven, which was approved uh, last uh, on January thirtieth. Uh, so we are comfortable with that and. Uh, Dr. Doherty is uh, prepared tonight to uh, show us what will make up that two million one thirty-seven. Uh, I think it will uh, solve uh, most of the in what was in the context of the two million four thirty-six. So, uh, with that said, uh, yes, Dr. Doherty. Thank you. So um, once the we knew um, the amount, and I, I do want to thank the Board of Selectmen for the process that they used. I know that was a long night, but I think it was an important process, so appreciate the work that the Selectmen went through that. Even a very thoughtful discussion. Um, what we did once we knew the amount is we went back and had conversations with um, our district leadership team to continue to talk about, okay, now that the funding amount has changed, how do we keep the core principles that we had it in the reconstruction budget and move forward with um, the amount that has, has been uh, voted on. So what we want to present to you this evening is a list. Um, we want to call it really the priority plan uh, because we don't look at the amount that we have proposing fund as a list and you're not going to see this in any order um, but it is a plan that totals the amount of funding that would be going to the school um, if a uh, override ballot question is approved by the community so just to give an overview um, <coughs> on January 22nd the school committee voted a reconstruction override budget amount of two million four hundred thirty six thousand dollars I'm going to just show that list in a minute um, on January 30th, the Board of Selectmen voted the override amount for $4,150,000. Uh, the school department amount for the override would be t is now $2,137,000. And I, I know there was a lot of discussion early in the process about capital and benefits, and um, that is already factored into the total amount that was approved by the Board of Selectmen. So, the two million one hundred thirty-seven thousand. Really, only we need to focus on is the the uh, priority plan, and not worry about the, the capital and benefit costs. That's already factored in um, to that four million one hundred fifty thousand. So here's the town school breakdown. Uh, we, we received this information from the town manager, based on the on the final board of selectmen vote of last week. Um, so you can see here that. Um, the benefits, you, you can see the, in the green, $4,150,000 is the amount voted by the Board of Selectmen. From that, $207,500 is capital, $601,750 is benefits, and then you have the breakdown of the 64, 36% schools in town for the remaining amount. Um, so that's how, it, that's how it breaks down, and you can see that the capital and the benefits has already been factored into that, that amount. John, uh, excuse me, can I, the, um, is that the price per household for the average household? I just want to clarify. Yes, I believe it is for the average for household, and I'm not sure what. That's 559,000. 500, 500, okay. So that's, <coughs> Bob had put that on that slide. This, this is the original list from the vote that the school committee took on January 22nd. And the only reason why I put this up here is because what you will see with this list is everything that we're going to be talking about this evening is either in one of two categories. It's either in our new priority plan or it's in the piece that did not make the priority plan. We have not added anything new to this list um, because this is the list that the school committee voted on. So we worked within the confines of the information that um, the school committee supported. 
So the priority plan that we're putting forward is focusing on the following. One is it's focused on restoring and retaining classroom teachers and classroom support. There are 16 FTEs on all three levels in the priority plan. It restores technology support and increases technology replacement for classrooms. I'm going to go into more detail in all of these. It creates a systems which will allow for an alignment of curriculum standards and teaching practices across all five of our elementary schools. We will strengthen all of our core instruction, which we call Tier 1, and you've heard that probably several times for all students. It will provide increased special education leadership for building support and program development. The stronger our programs are in district, um, the more our students can be with their peers in our community. It creates a sustainable model for curriculum renewal, and it restores athletics to the current level. And most importantly, because I know that this has been a real concern, uh, we've received this question a lot of times, it builds in expenses to allow for greater sustainability in years two and three. Uh, we're doing everything we can, and we are working very closely with the town, and I think you saw that with the amount, um, how there was an amount taken out for capital, and there was an amount taken out for benefits. We are doing everything we can to put the budgets in a place where we have greater sustainability in the, in the um, outgoing years, um, because we do not want to be in a situation where, in years two and three, uh, we are reducing staff. So here is the recommended funded override reconstruction budget priority plan. Um, and again, as I said, this is looked upon as one group and they're not necessarily in any priority order. Um, and I'm gonna go through these in greater detail, but you can see that it includes retaining the seven middle school teachers, restoring five high school teachers, retaining three elementary teachers, retaining one regular education tutor. Um, there are salary adjustments in here for retaining and attracting staff. There is an amount of money that is earmarked for curriculum updates and renewal, um, teacher training, for science, ELA, and math that will be aligned with the curriculum updates and renewal. Um, there are two positions called curriculum coordinators, which I will get into a little bit more detail in a minute. It's restoring the computer technician that was cut out of the FY18 budget. It will have computer replacement. Um, it will add a .5 special education team chair, and it will restructure a .5 FTE rise preschool director, assistant director. And it will also restore the athletic schedule and the after school elementary course. So that's a quick snapshot of the list um, and the amounts associated. I do want to point out again, and this uh, speaks to the sustainability piece, that we have $300,000 in expenses um, and 1.837. 250 in wages. And again, we've purposely built in expenses um, for that sustainability piece in future years. So the first area that I want to talk about is retaining and restoring the teaching staff and the student support. So as I said, 16 FTE are proposed. This is a combination of the classroom teachers, which is 15 of those FTEs, and the uh, elementary tutor. Um, that is 69% of the total funding that is being requested in the priority plan. It retains the middle school model and schedule, including grade 6 ELA, grade 7 and 8 foreign language. It retains elementary class sizes for grades 3 through 5 at, at mid-20s. It retains the current elementary tutor hours during the school day. It provides additional course sections at Reading Memorial High School. It allows for more advanced placement classes across all disciplines. And it is going to use the NEAS process, which our staff is currently going through with, at the high school to restructure current offerings. So you will see that restructuring occur in future years as they go through the NEAS process. It provides opportunities to retain and attract staff by making salaries more comparable with other communities through the collective bargaining process. So all of that is in the retain and restore teaching staff student support piece. <coughs> in the learning and teaching support piece, there's a couple of sections here that I want to emphasize. So first of all, it's the curriculum replacement and renewal. Um, we are earmarking funding for, for this uh, every year. In FY19, it will be focused primarily on science. 
In future years, we are looking at curriculum frameworks that are either in the pipeline or have recently been approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, including social studies in computer science. We also know there is a need at our elementary level for additional literacy materials, and that would be part of this earmarked funding. It also provides ongoing training for the teachers and staff across all grade levels, pre-K to 12, to improve student learning, and it provides increased technology support and technology replacement of older computers. So we're going from, a dis from moving from a current eight-year cycle, which we have right now, of computer replacements to a five-year cycle. The other piece that's important to note about the technology replacement is that next year, Reading Memorial High School, like our other seven schools, will be, going, uh, will be doing MCAS testing online so we are going to need to put some funding uh, to replace current computer labs uh, here at Reading Memorial High School too um, in preparation for the online MCAS testing in grade 10, 9 and 10. In terms of the leadership piece, what we want to do um, is create the systems and an infrastructure to reflect the demands of our new educational standards. And we want to address the challenges of meeting the needs of all students. We also want to make sure we provide additional special education leadership to support and strengthen our in-district programs. So the positions on the prioritized list include a curriculum coordinator for math and science, a curriculum coordinator for ELA and social studies, a .5 FTE special education team chair, and a .5 FTE assistant director. And I'm going to go into more detail in all of these positions. So first, the curriculum coordinators. And I, I want to go to the classroom experience. So our overall goal is we want to make sure that every student in every elementary classroom, K to 12, uh, K, to, K to 5, has the same set of learning experiences from classroom to classroom, from grade level to grade level, and that there is a transition, a natural transition of curriculum and learning experiences that builds upon each other. So our students will benefit directly from having these two positions. Um, it will provide the coordination necessary for a smooth transition to middle school so that we make sure that we have our five elementary schools feeding into our two middle schools and that they have the same curricular experiences when they go into Coolidge and Parker in grade six. These are K to six curriculum coordinator positions. Um, it will also facilitate ongoing improvement of our educational program, coordinate and maintain curriculum documents such as maps, pacing charts, align to state standards, provide content expertise because we're going to have a math science person and a social studies ELA person. They're going to provide feedback for staff and coordinate and provide ongoing training for teachers. And they're also going to work with staff to ensure that all the curriculum objectives are aligned with the state standards. The next two slides show some of the responsibilities of the curriculum coordinators. Um, certainly collaborating with teachers, evaluating purchasing incorporation of texts so that we have common curriculum materials across all five schools, um, making sure that staff understand the state standards, um, facilitating horizontal alignment of curriculum, which is across grade level in five schools, and vertical, which is K to six working with the assistant superintendent and principals to implement school and district objectives aligned with our district improvement plan, working with our assistant superintendent to organize and conduct professional development at the elementary, making sure our curriculum maps and guides and pacing charts are updated on a regular basis in alignment with our, any changes that are being made at the state level, and um, investigating and identifying appropriate resources to implement that curriculum. In addition, providing ongoing staff training, um, serving as mentor coordinator for our new teachers, organizing all uh, in-house staff development, um, working with the data coach to identify areas to strengthen, evaluating staff in a secondary role, so supporting our building principals in this area, and conducting classroom walkthroughs and providing feedback. In terms of the special education leadership, I've set up a, a slide here that shows the current model and with the additional uh, positions, what it's going to look like in the future. So the current model, we have a total of four FTE of special education leadership at the elementary level and the preschool level. Three of those are elementary team chairs. We have one currently at Joshua Eaton, 0.5 at other elementary schools. 
And we have one preschool director slash team chair at RISE. We do not have an assistant director in our current model. In our proposed model, which is the equivalent of adding an additional, adding an, an FTE, we're going to move from 3.5 elementary team chairs plus a 0.5 RISE team chair. What this model will look like is we'll have 1.0 at Joshua Eaton, 1.0 at Killam, and those two will have their own team chair because those are our two biggest elementary schools. 1.0 at Barrows and Birch Meadow, and 1.0 at Wood End and Rise. And the reason why we're connecting Wood End and Rise because we have the Rise Preschool Program also at Wood End. This also would split the current Rise Preschool Director slash Team Chair position to a Team Chair and um, Preschool Director. That other .5 will be combined with the .5 that I, of the additional position to form a new position, which is an Assistant Director slash Preschool Director. What this allows us to do is provide greater oversight and support to our special education programs and teachers puts greater focus on our development of special education programs and improvement, and it will provide support for our building principles at the elementary level. The last piece of this is athletics. So there is an amount of funding that's put aside to restore in the priority plan to restore athletics game schedule to the current level and the elementary chorus after school program. These are the items that are not proposed to be funded. Again, we had to make some, some decisions. Uh, there is one FTE high school teacher that we are not restoring. In conversations that I've had um, with various staff at the high school level, what we're seeing is the needs are to add pieces of the five FTE to each department, which will allow them to increase core sections of, of current sections that have high class sizes, to increase the number of advanced placement courses, and in future years be able to restructure those courses based on the NEASC um, standard recommendations. We also uh, are not funding the 1.9 FTE elementary assistant principals, special education team chair that um, we originally proposed, the uh, 1.0 FTE clerical support, which is a payroll HR generalist, and the two vacation cleanings at the high school. I want to break down the actual um, the amount of the 2.14, what it looks like. So if you break it down to wages and expenses, it's 86%, 14%, ironically, and this wasn't done on purpose, it's almost identical to what our current breakdown is in our full balance budget. When you break it down by priorities, um, this is the percentage, 69% is for classroom teachers, 3% is for classroom support, which is your technician. The teaching and learning support is all of your curriculum material, training, technology. 14% is the leadership piece of the special education pieces and the curriculum coordinators, and 1% is for the athletics. I do want to briefly talk about communication because communication has been critical up to this point and will continue to be critical. I believe Mr. Berman mentioned that also. So some of the things that we've been doing to educate the community about the budget, and we will continue to do this, um, the entire um, school community receives our newsletters every Sunday um, in the blog. Um, and in those, there have been budget bulletins. We've had nine budget bulletins that have outlined various stages of the budget process. We will continue to do that um, from now until April, uh, giving the information. Uh, we have been um, going to school council and PTO meetings. Uh, Mrs. Dowd and I have been, in fact, today we're at um, Joshua Eaton, uh, really to educate um, the school councils and the PTOs about the, the different aspects of the budget. We've been holding optional staff meetings and we will continue to do that with our in-house staff to help them uh, answer any questions they may have about the budget. We've been holding office hours, um, been holding at least two to three office hours a week. Um, school committee's been holding office hours. We will continue to offer those opportunities. And we have been receiving emails and questions from the community, which um, we have been answering as well. So that is some of the communication that's been going on, and certainly um, 
who were open to looking at other methods of communication. Um, and we know that there's certain rules and regulations that we need to follow but, uh, as we move forward in this process. So, so that's an overview of the plan. Uh, Dr. Dory, just, I have just one question on the, so one of the, the <coughs> concerns I've had for a couple, few years anyway, uh, and it looked, and it, it, we were trying to address that in the, in the original number was uh, help with teacher evaluations. Yes. Uh, and so, because I mean that to me is a very important thing. So, to what extent, if any, do the curriculum coordinators able are they able to do that? I noticed that the the last bullet there where they're doing walkthroughs and stuff. Are they going to be able to help out with any of the evaluations as well? The <coughs> the curriculum coordinators will have an evaluation role. Okay. Um, they will have more of a secondary evaluation role, but they will have an evaluation role. Uh, team chairs also have an evaluation role. Uh, with the expansion of the team chairs, I, I would see that expanding as well. Um, those are certainly conversations that we want to have with the elementary principals and uh, actually all the principals to see what that would look like. But yes, the goal is to provide some relief, some support for our elementary principals, especially in this area. Yeah, I mean, the and with that position, that we're not that's not included in this re, in this new list uh, which is what we're trying to get help for the elementary principals for the for the, with the assistant principal so hopefully then yes we're still able to do that with this thank you any other mr yes i just just to build on that i i just also want to acknowledge most of the elementary principals are in the room and they've been in the room for many of our meetings um, so I think, uh, you know, it was and when, when uh, Mr. Robinson said we could, um, we would do our very best to work with this number, it was not because the other things are not needed. And we're probably, by the time we get around to another uh, um, infusion of capital, we'll probably be the only district um, in the area that doesn't have uh, elementary assistant principals. Uh, cap don't use the word capital here. You mean <laughs> of, of funds. Revenue. Funds, yeah. revenue, sorry. Um, so I, I think it was a very hard decision and, and Mr. Robinson spoke very well for on behalf of the committee on the 30th. I think o overarching that was how critical it was that this override be sort of one reading, one future, one question so that we can pull everyone together into an override that passes. And I'm very cognizant and aware that some of the people who this impacts that are sitting in the room with us impacts the most. And um, I, don't, I don't know how many more terms I would potentially have to serve to see that done, but thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Boivin. Yes, yeah, so I, I have some questions about the, the two coordinator roles. So these are two uh, FTE, that would be new FTE, uh, they would support K to six. Correct. And so it's got a few questions and I'm wondering if you can, I'm just going to ask them rapid sure. fire and you can kind of address them in whatever order you want. So whenever we're adding new positions, so this I view as part of what I'll call the, uh, divided this overall request into five buckets. One of them is a curriculum piece. It's about 20% of the ask here, right? And so I put in that bucket the 150K in curriculum updates, 75K in training, and then about 190K in these coordinators. First, first question is just the title coordinator. For some of us in the, who spend more of our lives in the private sector, a coordinator can be used as a term for an administrative assistant or a project assistant. That is not what this is, as I understand it. So I'm wondering, first of all, if you could talk to the level of, of professional expertise and experience that these positions would require. Um, secondly, I'm wondering if you could speak to the challenge that we have here in Reading with five elementary schools and how common or uncommon that is among peer districts. I think districts have four or fewer for the most part. Five is a lot um, to, to court to kind of make sure that a student at one school in a grade is receiving the same curriculum, the same quality of education as, as a student in a different building. So please, please talk to that point. Uh, and then also talk to the recent demands on these teachers who have to teach multiple subjects to students at a young age 
uh, in a classroom that's increasingly being overseen by the state in the last maybe five years or so. So I think a lot of people have recollections, myself included, of, of a grade school experience many years ago, um, some of us more than others, that I think looked very different than what it looks like today in the classroom and that there's a lot of, I think, pressure on teachers to have to teach to a curriculum and still manage a classroom and still ensure that all, all students' needs are being met, you know, some of them on IEP, some not. Uh, so if, if you could speak to the role of the coordinator and in, in why you and your principals viewed this as a, a really essential component and, and you chose to put it in the 20% of this ask that we're asking taxpayers to support. So help us understand that better, please. Sure. So um, the actual word curriculum coordinator is a common um, position in, in, in a lot of other school districts. So um, it does mean something different in the education world. <laughs> it, it is an administrative position. Um, it is a person that has been an educator, a teacher, a classroom teacher in most cases, and uh, someone that has content knowledge background in at least one area and most likely more than one area. So uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, someone that is well versed in the humanities, social studies um, and literacy, um, and someone be more versed in the STEM areas. Uh, so those are the type of people that we're looking for. Um, these are also people that I have a, a very vast knowledge of um, the state frameworks and understands um, how a standards-based education works and the types of instructional practices that you need for classrooms so that all students can access the curriculum. It will help with, uh, we've used the term tier one instruction, core instruction. Um, that's, the, that's our base instruction that all students get. And the stronger that instruction and that curriculum is, um, the more it benefits all students. And it will help with, um, you, what we will see is we will see less students that would need intervention. We would see less students that would need special education referrals. Um, those, those are where we're going to see the benefits of these. Um, it is not, and I want to emphasize this, it is not going to decrease our um, special education needs because there are always going to be students that are going to require services. There are always going to be students that are going to require um, special programs. That is not the intent of these. But what it will do is it will decrease referrals because those students will be getting a stronger curriculum, core curriculum, and they'll be getting the supports that they need um, in the classroom. So that's, that's that piece. Um, your second question was about five elementary schools. So we are we are in the minority in that, and we our our district for our size, um, most districts our size have four or less. Um, that does come with some strains um, in terms of both coordination and financial. So you know, and we and we see that that was obviously a decision that was made many many years ago. Um, so you know, it's it's. It's a, it's a discussion, you know, a community discussion that happened. I was a middle school principal when this discussion was happening. Um, you know, it's, it's neighborhood schools, valuing neighborhood schools versus having larger elementary schools that aren't necessarily neighborhood schools. So it's that, it's the pros and cons to that. Having neighborhood schools is, you know, you have to be much more coordinated and it is, um, it comes at a higher uh, cost. Um, but there is, there is value and benefit to having neighborhood schools as well. Because um, they are a little bit smaller, your class sizes tend to be a little bit smaller, although, you know, you do lose the economy of scale um, when you have um, five elementary schools versus four or three. And then your last question was the elementary experience. So, I've always said this, and I've said it to elementary, I believe our elementary teachers are, I mean, all of our teachers work hard, but to me, they are the hardest working teachers in the district because they have to teach five different subjects, um, and they always have to teach things differently. I mean, we've got new literacy, 
standards. We've got new math standards. Social studies is now coming down the pike. Um, they have to integrate technology. Um, they teach open circle. They work. They work with students with open circle and social emo uh, social emotional learning curriculum. Um, they teach science. We have a new curriculum, No Adam, that that we're integrating in grades three through five. So our elementary teachers have been. Um, given a lot of new curricula over the last few years. Um, and they have, you know, they have to be able to work with students in all of these different curriculum areas. In addition to that, our classrooms are more diverse than they were 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, we have a much more inclusionary environment that we, than we did before. And so our student, our teachers need to have the tools to be able to um, address all of the students in that classroom. Which is why all of this that we are proposing is going to support them. The training, the technology replenishment, the technician who's going to fix their computer in the classroom. Um, you know, the, the curriculum renewal so that they have the most updated material. Uh, the curriculum coordinators who are going to work with them to make sure they have the aligned curriculum necessary to teach. So all of these things is going to help support our classroom teachers at the elementary. I think I hit all three. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. No, I think, I think you got everything. I, I just want to follow up on a couple points. So you, one of the things you said early on was it is administrative. That means it's in the administrative cost center. But it's... These would not be in the administrative the process. Coordinator. It would be in the regular day. Line. It would be in the regular day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. The uh, and, and could you describe in a little more detail how these? Per well, I guess a quick and easy question first, and then and then a broader question. Math, science. We got one person for that, and then someone else called ELA, social studies, K to six, both. Mm -hmm. Right. So for all four of those subjects, are there applicable state curricula that? we have to teach our students that they will be assessed on? Yes. Um, well, social studies, we do not have a state assessment at this time. Um, but there's a standard. Right? There are standards, yes. Um, there is a talk of a social studies test coming down the road. So, so for all four of these, there is a state curriculum that's required that yes. we have to ensure that? Absolutely. Okay. And then the interactions that these two people would have, these two positions would have, could you just describe in a little more detail for, for us? Are they going to be meeting with teachers? Daily, weekly, what's the vision for? And I know there's some flexibility that you have to have because it may change depending on <coughs> the need of the students and the staff. But is, is this a direct student interaction? Is this just a teacher behind the scenes, teacher um, coordinator interaction? What types of interactions with but these two? They will not be working with students. Okay. Um, that wouldn't be their role. And the role is more of, and, and they're not, we. We've never had these positions in the district, and people may think that this was the, the coach position that we had a few years ago. This is not the coach position. So they primarily will not be coaches. They will be working with teachers and administrators coordinating the curriculum and making sure that we have consistency among all of our five schools, um, both across grade level and pre-K to 12, uh, pre-K to 5. So five, to six. five days? Going yeah, this, yeah they, most of their time they're going to be spending with them is going to be during um, the, the meeting times that we have set aside, um, the uh, after school time, the full day professional days, um, you know, those, those types of opportunities. So last question, is it fair to characterize them as experts that we would be bringing into our district to inform and support our teachers in ensuring compliance with our state required curriculum and frameworks? Yeah, I don't like to use the word the compliance, but yes. <laughs> well, just to clarify that, so these individuals may exist in the district now. They very well could, yes. Okay. They very well could. Yes. Anybody else waiting? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, to help me understand also, would these coordinators also, oh, do I need this one too, yeah. would also be working with the data coach, I'm assuming? Is that yes. right? Uh, that yeah, it the says there before. on the, okay. Because, you know, I was, as I was thinking about, 
um, the proposed override budget. I pulled the elementary school test That's score it. numbers and I was really startled to see how even in one school you might have numbers that are you know 30 40 points different from each other so I, I personally am really excited about um, this support for the elementary schools but I think one thing is a lot of times we're focusing on where are our scores low and that happens but I was also really struck when I was looking at um, the scores it, that, that we have pockets where certain schools like I think Woodend are just excelling on some topics like science or um, English and I love the idea that with the data coach and these coordinators we not only are going to look at where there may need strengthening and consistency but we can also identify where are things going right and um, which teachers seem to have nailed something that we can then take and use as a model and use to teacher train across because there are pockets in every school of strength um, in all of these disciplines, I think. And so I like that it can actually build on the strengths and assets we do have, but we probably just don't have the capacity to identify and replicate at this time. Correct. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Uh, yeah, just along those lines, I think, you know, we're talking about standards, but I know one of the things that we also try to focus on in this district is student growth. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that's one of the things that um, I would hope would be accelerated and um, you know especially the, the the other aspects of this that help focus on that sort of our regular day tier one that the teaching that's in the classroom to provide the supports for all students so um, I think these are things that could help contribute to the growth rates that we like to see because even students who are achieving you know at the highest levels need to experience high growth rates right they can't top out and so it's not enough for me to just talk about you know where you are on a on a mark on a grid in terms of the performance level so i think there's there's a lot of pieces of this that will help that great thanks dr dr um. I wanted to make the point and, and thank you that um, these curriculum coordinators will no longer be responsible for K through 8. I was I thinking that that would be a very overwhelming span for these people to have responsibility over actually five to seven schools because that would have included the middle schools and so I think honing in on that. Um, was a really important improvement in this plan. Um, and I also wanted to um, just clarify for myself, so you talked about coaches and the difference between what these curriculum coordinators and coaches do. And from my understanding, these curriculum coordinators will be helping to translate what the frameworks require of our teachers to do with their students to achieve the learning that's necessary in their classes. So these curriculum coordinators will also be facilitating the communication between the teachers around these curriculums and enabling them, the teachers, to work together to learn better how to, to um, implement the curriculum um, and will these curriculum coordinators also enable these teachers to watch each other while their classes have someone that know the curriculum so that the learning doesn't stop in their classroom while the teachers are improving their understanding of the curriculum. Did that make sense? Yes, it does. So here's, here's, they're not going to be coaches. So we can't expect them to do both. It'll be, it's impossible. What they will be doing is working with our building principals and other administrators to identify who are those teachers and to set up those opportunities. But they're not going to be the ones doing, going into the classes and acting in the coach role. We, they just can't do both. Um, we, we need people at this level so that we can have consistency among our schools. And it, it's, it's going to be the partnership of our building principals with the coordinators 
and our other administrators, including our special education team chairs, um, to integrate that regular ed special ed model that we've been talking about here to ensure that we have the strongest tier one instruction we can have. Thank you. Yes, well. If John, could you just put um, slide 14 back up that you, you just were mentioning, the special education leadership? Because I think, um, you know, I think this is a really important piece of the whole picture. And, you know, we've, we've been talking for a long time uh, that we needed that assistant director of student services for special education. And I think that this is a really, um, as is typical, a very creative way to use the resources and really provide the key pieces of um, functionality that we need in the district. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that, and I appreciate you sort of explaining that. I have one other topic. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that I think that it is important that we restore those two um, non-league games. And in looking this over, um, there, you know, if if I had, um, you know, if there was another 150,000 then there would probably be a different decision point here because I would be very seriously um, saying that we need to we need to do what we need to do around the assistant principals, but there isn't another 150,000. And to me, this is something that I know there's a difference of opinion in the community. Um, I have very long and hard fought for prioritizing our, our academics and our instruction and curriculum um, and teachers. But I, I recognize that the athletics is a big piece of what we do here. Um, you know, and there was prior discussion of taking a major cut out of that budget, which would have just been disastrous. So I think the $25,000 to restore the non-league games for the, the sports and the elementary course, but the sports that really rely on those two, one or two non-league games to help um, improve the competitiveness and, and provide that experience for the students is important. And, and there, to my mind, there isn't anything sort of below the line that we could do differently. I would not prioritize, as much as I want the buildings to be clean, I would definitely not prioritize that over um, restoring the games. Ms. Borowski. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple of points to make and a suggestion. The, the first thought I had when I read this is that with 69% of the potential available funds fully funding direct student facing teaching positions, I do feel like this plan, the one that we voted originally as well as this one with the, the smaller amount, um, reflects community priority that we all heard. Clearly the community wants the focus to be on restoring teaching positions and getting people in front of our students. So I feel very good about that. As I looked over this over the, the last week, looking over our original list and thinking, how would I tackle paring it down? Um, my eye went right to the expenses because that's sort of the easiest thing. And I think your point about Dr. Doherty about it, uh, sustainability is really important. A little tricky to understand, but I do think it builds in sustainability. So it's really important that the entire number not be FTEs. I think it's a really good, it was a very thoughtful approach and a, a good point. So I, I want to re reiterate that and commend it. Um, <coughs> I think my colleague, Mrs. Webb, said we'd certainly like to do it all. I certainly would. But um, if we can't, then this feels like a reasonable path. I do have a suggestion, and it is stepping into management, so I will just make the suggestion for the, for the administrative team to take away. As you're developing the evaluation for the curriculum coordinator positions, think about getting feedback from staff and principals, and think about specific measurable results. You know, what after a year, after two years, what should be different in the district that you can measure? Um, that we don't have right now. I think that would really build community faith that this is a good investment um, and certainly committee support as well. So that's just sort of a takeaway for you um, as you're thinking about them. Good point. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> no, yeah, make a motion. Um, I'll, the motion would be moved to accept the list of funded items as presented in the amount of $2,137,250. John, can you put that slide up just so we have it? Yep. Which is called our uh, reconstruction budget. Is there a second? Second. second. Ms. Downing? Yes. 
Hi, Mary Ann Downing, Heather Drive. Just building on Dr. Doxer's question about how you paired it from K to 8 down to K to 6. The 6th grade is still in the middle school, so I'm just curious why you don't call these K to 5 curriculum coordinators. Because they're going to be helping with the transition of curriculum to the middle school. Okay. So they will be working with sixth grade teachers and middle school principals. Okay, and um, one more point that I noticed in the curriculum coordinator duties. I noticed some of the bullet points mentioned um, coordinate and maintain curriculum documents, i.e. curriculum maps and pacing charts, um, and to provide ongoing evaluation of curriculum maps, curriculum guides, pacing charts. It seems like those bullets presume that the curriculum maps, pacing charts are in existence. And I recall back when you were talking about the district goals and what Mr. Um, Mr. Martin's bandwidth was and there were all these curriculum maps and pacing charts that needed to get developed that some, we had some done and some not. So my question is, are the curriculum you can tell me or not whether these exist yet, but will the curriculum coordinators be creating these um, pacing guides and charts if they don't exist? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? This um, thank you for that question. It is a good one. Um, but I actually really like the idea of including sixth graders in it because I feel like the sixth grade team is in the best position to help the curriculum coordinators know where gaps are. They're just another check. You know, you're in the sixth grade team and you're getting kids from multiple elementary schools. I think they very likely would, would be the group who might spot, boy, kids from this school are insanely strong at this, but this not so much. So I, it seems very logical to me to include them. So I like the approach. Yes. <coughs> yeah, sure. So they look, look here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to add one point. The importance of the, a real coherent vertical curriculum, that one of the values of curriculum coordination, in addition to the actual work with the administrators and teachers that Dr. Doherty was talking about, that the people really do have an understanding of the secondary curriculum, even though they're not working directly always with those people, because the point is to make sure that we are coordinated and properly preparing kids for the next step. Um, and that's an important part of it. Um, that's why many districts, whether they're K-5, K-8, K-12, they have a good long-term view. There's very few people in district that have that full pre-K-12 view of the arc. Um, you know, and we're able, these people are able to see that sometimes issues that come up in sixth grade or seventh grade might be from several years behind, before. Um, and so those people are able to help address those sorts of issues in any of those areas, whether it's STEM or humanities. So, thank you, Mr. And so, I wanted to speak to the. Ms. Borowski had some really good points that I want to, I want to extend a little bit. Um, my number one concern with the original request, um, which I voted against, uh, was the, was twofold, really, both related to the word sustainability. I was concerned, and and do remain concerned about, and, and I think this point was just made, adding FTE to our district um, at FY19 and subsequent levels and not knowing the true cost of that um, with enough certainty or having enough evidence of that. In other words, if in the past five years, we've pulled out 3.4 million out of our district. So every year for the last five, we've shrunk the number of FTEs in our district, or at least the last four. And every, even after reducing the size with budget cuts, the district grows in its cost for level service to 4.8 to 5% or so. And, and so my, my main concern was having enough evidence that whatever proposal we recommend uh, to the taxpayer and to the town, that I see enough evidence that we're going to be able to pay for it, that we don't bite off more than we can chew. My concern wasn't whether there would be educational benefit to all of the proposals. I think there is. But I just want to make sure that I see enough evidence to feel comfortable in, about paying for it. I think this strikes a, a much better balance to me on that point. And, and Jean, I think, made this point in part by saying that there's a lot of reductions here in full-time equivalents compared to what we saw in the original request. And, and I think they were thoughtful reductions. Um, there are additions beyond the current FY18 levels, so this reverses the FY19 cuts. Most notably, it re restores the middle school structure that we have this year, restores foreign language fully to the middle school, it restores an extra uh, 
ELA teaching block for the sixth graders. Um, it restores and maintains the, um, the number of students per ELA teacher that we have this year um, by undoing cuts that we just made in the FY19 budget. I think that's essential for the, for the future of our schools. It brings back elementary school teachers. Uh, and then we had not six, but five high school teachers back. And so to Gene's point, I really see, you know, when I, when I put these, um, this request into buckets, you know, I'd see about 50 to 60% of this is going right into the classroom, in terms of classroom teaching. 52% um, uh, middle school and high school and elementary school and tutors that I put all together at about 1.1 million. So I think that reflects the priorities of, of putting teachers back in the classroom and doing and, and, and keeping that as our at the center of our thinking. Um, about 19% the our curriculum updates, training, and coordinators that we just talked about. I think that's important because we we need to support what teachers are teaching in the classroom, and I, and I think that. 19% or 415K when I add up on that list, costs and expenses to, you know, mixing the two, but I get a number of 415K, about 19%. And then there's a longevity or salary uh, retention piece. It's about 17%, 360K. And then the last two are technology at about 5% and supporting special ed at 5 to 6%. So that's a mix that I think was was really thoughtfully generated. Um, it's it's not everything that was in the original request. Um, we've come to greater clarity since our last vote um, with a number of meetings of the selectmen, um, and I think come to some alignment with the town that is fair and reasonable to me about how we calculate the costs of added FTE in terms of benefits that you know I think is is reasonable and accounts for the idea that you know the cost of our FTEs will will increase over time we can't know perfectly what that's going to be but I think I think the estimates that we've come up with are reasonable so I, I think this strikes the right balance between you know asking the taxpayer for additional funds and their hard-earned money uh, and balancing that against the the very real needs of our kids um, we definitely need an override and I, and I think I support this this um, request and, and its priorities so Thank you for your hard work in revising this to the selectman's number, and thank you this, for the selectman for working hard the other other day. That was a you know very um, it, it was a long meeting, but I think it was a very healthy process. And I want to thank the selectman for coming to a um, you know a number that they could all agree on. And I'm optimistic that tonight there's a number that everybody sitting here can agree on, including me. So I want to thank everyone for their hard work. Let's go do this, Reading. We. I can't tell you how to vote on a political question, but I can say um, it's been a long process. I'm very pleased with where we are. I support this, and thank you for everyone who worked for this. Yes. Just, um, I, I think there were also a lot of people in the room that night that caused that outcome. And so I think acknowledging all of the people who were present to fight for what they believed in and stood for um, and ensure that this was one ballot question for one community which since 1992, there were two ballot questions, one in 93, one in 2003. They were both single questions that incorporated both the municipal and the school services for our community to consider. And I was just doing a little math myself. Um, and if you consider that you go to work 260 days, not counting the weekends a year, um, then if the cost of on the average household we always look at the average household for what we've asked or been able to do here is a dollar a day per work day make your own coffee on the weekend and then um and for the municipal side it's 60 cents and then the benefits and capital is about 40 cents worth of that um, for a, for an overall two dollars a day for this override on the average household and i think that after 15 years we should all find a way to do that because this is all so important to our kids so anyways, i obviously support it yeah any other discussion yes and all of us have worked really hard to, to to look for other ways and 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 to really reduce the request to the taxpayer to things that like believe me I've looked at many 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 options and I personally this this is a good this is a good path forward for Reading um, not having 
um, these resources in place, I think we have to acknowledge the flip side of this is that if, if this isn't something that the taxpayer wants to provide us with, the, the cuts to the schools next year would be absolutely devastating. Well, in a, to, to my personal calculations, in excess of 600000 um, there, there's nowhere that you find the money, and I've looked everywhere, and I, I have done everything I personally know how to do to, to come up with creative solutions. We saw some of that the other day. I, I, I personally, again, I can't speak for this committee just as an individual. This, this is a good request. We need this as a town, and there, this, this is a, I agree with this. I, I just, I've tried many, many other things, and this is uh, a hard thought, well thought out, and I think I think a healthy reflection of our priority on education as a, as a community. And if you know the absence of this is that there's nowhere to find this money. There's nowhere to find this money in, in these in these budgets. I've looked, and it's not like if we don't have an override, oh, we'll find the money. There is no. It will it will devastate the school system if we don't have this. Um, personally, that's my personal view. It's not my view as a school committee member, um, although I'm sitting in that chair. Um, I just want to assure the taxpayer that it, this is. I support this wholeheartedly. Yep. Ready for the vote. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you, Dr. Gardy. Thank you. Do you want to, you want to start the piece? No. no. We're going with Joe. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see him walk out. I've been looking the whole time. Where's Joe? <laughs> Sorry, he snuck in. Great. Yep. Thanks, John. Hello, everybody. Um, as many of you people are aware, we're um, applying for a statement of interest for uh, the accelerated repair program for the MSBA. And we just got through um, completing the application. It was a two-part process. We had to go through, and there was two pieces of it, the educational and impact slash history for the, um, the Reading Public Schools. And in particular, we had to do a facilities background and history for the high school. This project is for a boiler replacement here at the Reading High School. Um, the, it's okay. Um, so as we went through this, um, we had to make sure that we, as far as the facilities background, and John can speak to the educational piece, uh, we had to uh, fill out a number of different sections on the condition of the high school. Um, it, we had to go through and assess the condition of the windows, um, the interior finishes of the building, the roof system, the electrical system here at the Reading Memorial High School. And the reason that they do that is to make sure that the asset that you're replacing is um, in a need, number one, and that the rest of the building does not need a full renovation. Um, and as many of you are aware, the boiler that we're replacing is um, a boiler that was put in here and taken out of the old building in 2005 uh, as a cost-saving value, engin value engineering measure. Um, and it was converted from a uh, number two oil burning uh, steam system to a gas fired hydronic system and it was put into this building in 2005 with the newer an another boiler next to it so some of the criteria we needed to follow in order to be considered is that the value of the project needs to exceed two hundred fifty thousand dollars the replacement of boiler number two is actually five hundred eighty five thousand dollars that includes everything all in demolition installation controls commissioning and it includes all the uh, construction administration fees um, the system has to be at least 20 years old um, the boiler is 20 years old it just happens to be it's 20 years old right now and the funding for the project has to be allocated and approved. Um, we do have money in our FY19 capital plan. Uh, we have $585,000 in the plan right now to replace boiler number two. And we've already begun a design for replacement of that boiler. That money will be available to us 
in uh, July, but we have already started a design with a mechanical engineering firm to get ready to go in the event that we do not get invited into the uh, MSBA program. So the SOI application deadline is this is next Friday the 16th. It requires a vote of the school committee and the board of selectmen, and it requires signatures of the school committee chair, the town manager, and the superintendent of schools. And the notification of this to participate are indicated somewhere in late spring, early summer. And if we're invited to participate, the construction will probably begin once you know every once their engineers come out and look at what we have sometime late next winter, early spring. If invited, we'll probably get around a 50% shared cost with the uh, MSBA on this project. Um, if we're not invited to participate, we will, it will if, if we don't get invited into the program, we have the funding available to do it ourselves, but we will have to delay the start of construction. And the way the MSBA works, if what we were, they explained to us is that 1% of all the sales tax revenue goes towards MSBA. So if the state of Massachusetts has a, a good year, so to speak, more money is allocated to districts statewide. So that gives you folks a general idea of where we are right now. And the, the overall objective of this is we wanted to at least submit the statement of interest. We're not sure whether or not we will be invited to participate, but we figured if we were, it's an opportunity to receive some reimbursement, but we had already intended to move forward with or without it, so this is sort of just the belts and suspenders to try to take advantage of any funding that is out there. So, so uh, I don't know if this is for Joe or Gail. Uh, if you go back to that, the slide that the next one right before the 50 percent is that up to 50 percent or is it is it could it is it 50 percent or nothing so there's a particular formula that they use um, depending on the community um, we would we would be eligible for approximately 50 percent so the which would be half of the 580 Correct. yes yes but we've already set aside. We already had this discussion a few weeks back about the 585. Correct. That's correct. Uh, this totally, this made me think of it when I was away. It's not directly related to this, but are we all done with the performance, energy performance contracting at no. this point? We have a 15-year agreement with Noresco. We're in year eight, I want to say, oh. and we have seven more years, and in those seven years, they guarantee their savings on consumption, um, that they guarantee the savings, and in order for us to um, to do that with them, we have something called measurement and verification, and they come in and they look at all of our preventive maintenance measures that we're doing, and they check to make sure that we're doing the manufacturer's recommended service intervals on all our equipment. They, and I think I showed slides at the two meetings ago as, as to where our consumption is lying, and we're tracking well con with the baseline consumption from 2009. So as part of this uh, process, do we have the ability to, to sneak in a letter of recommendation from them or to talk about what we're doing? Just because, I mean, to me, that makes us a, a better risk than others that they're... So what we're replacing boiler number two with is, um, what we have right now is two 8 million BTU boilers. They're Cleaver Brooks boilers. They're re very reliable, but they are not as energy efficient as what we're going to put in. And we're going to okay. take that one out of there, and we're going to put three high efficiency condensing boilers on the same pad that the Cleaver Brooks boiler sits on. These boilers will modulate a lot, much better than the Cleaver Brooks do, and they actually perform a lot better um, under load, so that uh, they will run a lead lag meaning that if when the, the, when the condensing boilers aren't running we can switch it over to the other one so that you get equal run time on them but the condensing boilers are, uh, save a lot of a lot of energy a less heat goes up the stack so that you get more energy in the system so that's what we're replacing it with so we are going with energy efficient right now so my question I guess is can we uh, just uh, emphasize that in our request for reimbursement. We did mention that in the SOI. We did put that in the SOI, what we were replacing it with. Great. And that it would be more energy efficient. Energy efficient. Correct. So we have within the process, there are multiple questions. We did articulate all of that 
with And I think they would want to invest in that. Mm -hmm. And the state would want to invest in communities that were yeah. doing that. We can definitely take another look at it and see if there's an area to expand on that. But that is one of the areas where we almost started each section was if we were approved and can move forward, here are the benefits. And the efficiency was definitely one of them. I, I, yes. I think so what Chuck was asking, do you build into it to your advantage the fact that we do the performance the, the performance contracting and that we have that ongoing management I mean so that they understand that we're doing such you know a high level of preventative maintenance and so one of the questions <coughs> has it has you outline what the capital plan is and they want to know how do we develop the capital plan mm -hmm. and then we go when we went through the whole thing and we just, just uh, described how we age our equipment and how we you know target it for replacement systematically um, also there was a section on uh, preventive maintenance and what are our maintenance practices in particular townwide and then particularly at this building right here so we had to spell out exactly what maintenance intervals we do and how we take care of our equipment yeah I mean I don't want to call this that I want to call this a windfall but I mean based on all the conversations we've been having over the last several nights here and the selectmen are mm -hmm. having if we can in any way cut that cost in half absolutely it's a it's a huge win I think mm -hmm. so Yes. I just uh, thank you for your work on this. This is a very exciting possibility. Like it is. As, as Mr. Robinson was just saying, a real, real possibility for the town. I do want to clarify for anybody watching who doesn't live their life around municipal budgets that this is all within the capital part of the budget. Correct. So um, it, we set aside a certain percentage of our budget, municipal and town, both every year that goes directly to capital. So I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, this is, if we get this, this is money that's now available to fund salaries or operating expenses. It yeah, most definitely is not. So I just want to make that's that. that that's very, not very, what I was suggesting. Oh, no, no, I'm making a different point. Yeah. Different, completely different point. Yeah. No, that's um, a very good. But I just want to be abundantly clear about that. The, it would go town. back to the town. It ultimately increases Into. our yeah, reserves. Yeah. 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 Well, or opens up more capital work, yeah. which is exciting yes. too. It's yeah. money that yes. can be redeployed for more capital work. So I mean, it's just pure good news. I'm very yeah. optimistic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Jean said what I was going to oh. say. Just can I? Thank you. <laughs> so much better. Is the, the FY19 capital plan, though, is a town meeting approved plan already. So it's already, this is already in an FY19. Because we, we approve capital for in the out years. I'm just sort of curious. We don't have to wait for the April town. This, this no, is not reliant on April town meeting. There is the FY19 capital plan is part of the 19 budget in case there I would have to check to see whether or not there have been any changes since the last time it was approved because projects can be moved funding right right to so change so right it would be part of the FY19 that's budget. already approved by well for, for schools for us yes. and by town meeting yeah okay yeah, so two points. First, just to try to recap, we can't use this money for anything <laughs> we, we talked about in the last 16 hours. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. We can't use it for teachers. Not, we not can't immediate. use it for overriding. Not we can't use it for <laughs> it cannot, it restructuring be anything. We can't use it for education. This is not operating money. This Correct. is capital expenses. It cannot be repurposed. All right. So just to be clear on that, it's yeah. not like, well, why didn't you get the boiler? Save the boiler. You could have. And just to check we actually we will not know whether or not. So it's a multiple step process. So we submit the applications by next Friday. So mm -hmm. we will be presenting this um, to the selectmen on the 13th, 13th as part yeah. of their meeting because they have to sign off on it. We submit it. They go through a process where they gather all of the information. It takes them about 8 to 12 weeks, they said, in order to determine who they're actually going to go out and visit and then what the next steps are. And then... A lot of it will depend upon the number of submissions, the value of the submissions, because they have a certain dollar amount. So if they, if the submissions exceed the funding available, they can come back and say it's no longer a 20 year, we're only going to look at anyone with a 30 year. So mm -hmm. this is step one, there's no guarantee that we will be invited. Right. So there's, it's not part of the school committee's budget for FY19, it's not part of the override request, something totally different. The question I have, Joe, for you, is is there any scenario, and this is a very open ended question, but I have two examples. Any scenario where we're worse off if we get the money? And let me give you two examples. So if we get the money, does and we make the boiler replacement mm -hmm. on the schedule we promise, 
um, as part of the application. Are there additional, we'll call them hidden costs, maybe that, let's say we have to rip out all the gas lines in the building and replace them or change the heating system mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, well, we got this new boiler, but now we have to, because we're making this change, we have to bring the rest of the heating systems up to code and that's gonna cost us a whole bunch more. So that's one question. And the second question, are, are there any oversights? If you're the winner of this money from the state, is, is there any additional kind of reporting requirements, oversight requirements that would cost us more time or money? So to answer your first question, um, we're probably in a better shape than most districts to do this because some people are in need right now. They have a boiler that's ready to die or it's dead and they don't have redundancy in their building. So if we were invited into the program, we would be set up to succeed probably better than a lot of people because we have the, the, the funding source already and we can get the boiler replaced. Some people can't wait and they need to get it done right now. So I don't know if that answer helps answer that first question. So as far as, um, I like to get the design done ahead of time of the capital uh, so that we can get, um, we, we had an early estimate done, 585,000. Our mechanical engineer is doing an estimate right now and we're pretty close, we're right on the money and it's pretty competitive right now. So we are going, we're looking at everything. It's, pretty, it's a pretty complicated job because of the venting, because we're going with condensing boilers. But we've been scouring the boiler room and making sure how we're going to exit the building with the vents. It's, it's not a really a slam dunk type of thing, but we feel really confident that we have a good plan in place and that our estimate is good. Um, not to say that there is, you know, you do, it's construction. It's construction. Right. <laughs> so. Yes. So, so the all-in cost, you're really thinking through not just the physical, the machine of the boiler, it's Installing the boiler, getting it up and running, complying with all the necessary So the, the, the cost estimate we have includes the uh, demolition of the old boilers, um, rigging them out, installing the new ones, replacing the pad that they sit on because the new boiler has to sit higher because it condenses and it has a pump on it. It'll also include a commissioning agent to come in and commission them and start them up properly, which a lot of people don't do, but we included that in there as a, as a, as a cost to commission them and start them up properly and run them and test them at the same time. Um, so I think we've done a pretty thorough job of looking at all the um, potential you know, problems we could run into. As far as the uh, MSBA involvement, they will be very involved. It be, if it becomes an MSBA project, I, we've done, uh, it used to be called the SBA. Green Schools. It was the Green SBA. School Repair Program. We did Birch Meadow Roof and, no, I'm sorry, we did Birch Meadow Windows, Kill em, Roof, Kill and Clear Story Windows. Mm -hmm. And they actually, they're very involved. They actually assign their own architect to do the work and oversee the project. So they have a big involvement and a vested interest if it becomes an MSBA project. They know what they're doing. They, they're, they're a good group to work with. Can I make the motion? Yeah. Ask a question? Uh, does somebody want more questions? No, go ahead. Okay. So um, I just want, I think you answered this, but you, this is preventive maintenance, basically, right? It's not that so the, our boiler is ready to die. So the boiler that's in there right now is uh, 20 years old, which yep. is young to replace a boiler. It should have been replaced um, when it was pulled over from the other building. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't here for that, to, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pulled over. We did not have a water treatment program in place at the time. So because of the nature of the steam system we have, the way it runs, there's a lot of... Um, um, scaling going on inside yep. of it and it yep. caused a lot of damage to that boiler so it aged it. We've put quite a bit of money into that boiler in the last five years replacing tubes um, and doing other pretty sizable repairs to it uh, and based on what I've seen in the past and what our uh, air condition, heating and air conditioning contractors telling us is it's, it's, it's ready. So it's re what I'm getting at I think is that it sounds to me like this process is, if we needed that boiler tomorrow, we almost couldn't even get this Correct. money, right? If something right. were so, to occur before yeah. we, this process completed, we would remove ourselves from the process. So basically, by if we were to delay, we could actually miss the opportunity to get even considered for this. So it's actually, would almost be not fiscally prudent to, to delay this if, 
this opportunity exists now because if it's an emergency situation then we're out of the running for this which is why part of the requirements is that you have to have the funding already yep. available such that if something were to occur you're moving forward okay. regardless thanks yes sorry one, one last quick question do, do we and I can't remember that if we ask this question is this the type of project that would go through it didn't we just form a building committee in town meeting is this something that would go no. through that or no, no. The it's not, it's it doesn't meet the threshold no. it's not yeah. a million. okay thanks I'll make the motion yes okay so this has a very specific motion because of it going to the MSBA um, resolved Having convened in an open meeting on February 5th, 2018, prior to the Statement of Interest submission closing date, the School Committee of Reading, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form dated February 2nd, 2018, for the Reading Memorial High School, located at 62 Oakland Road, Reading, Mass., which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Priority five, accelerated repair program for the replacement of boiler number two at the Reading Memorial High School, which is approaching the end of its useful life, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So, second. second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, is there any other? I just wanted to say thank you for search to our administrators um, for searching out these opportunities yes. to help us free the costs that we're going to have to pay anyways, and being proactive about it, so that we're not faced with boiler failure, failure, and higher costs with damages as well. Yes. This isn't um, regarding the boiler at all. I actually came late, and I apologize. I wasn't here for public comment, but I heard that um, kindergarten half day came up in discussion. Um, I know that it's going to be split with Killam and JE for half day, correct? And I is is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So I got a couple questions from parents who wanted to know if it's going to flip-flop for like afternoon, morning like they used to. It is? Well, it, it depends on, it, all of this will be outlined in the letter that they're going to receive this week. Okay. And then I just had a question for the school committee. This never kind of hit the, I pay really close attention to what goes on. This never seemed to came, come up in discussion, did it? Yeah. I Once think it did. Yeah, so yeah, we had a, one of our public meetings talking about I did bring it up it. during the budget process, mm -hmm. and when we had kindergarten orientation in November for the kindergarten parents, we made it clear that we may have satellite kindergarten. Okay. For half day this year. Okay. I'm just, as a parent, I'm frustrated because I would have loved to have come and just explained to you why half day is really frustrating for me as a parent to be split the way it's going to be split. I have three children who will be at Rise, Birch, and now JE or Killam, and I understand they're going to have a later start time. It's going to be pushed. But as a parent, I have a little girl that was so excited to go to Birch Meadow with her brother and I understand that was kind of the the problem when we were looking at the early education childhood center that a lot of parents were upset about that and it's water under the bridge but um, as a parent I would have liked to have had the heads up that you guys were gonna bring this on the agenda tonight because I would have it was part of a report. it was part of my report. And it was report. not an agenda item. right and I'm saying I wish it was an agenda item yes. it, it's not it's an administrative decision that we have to do um, because of the needs of the the kids we have very few half-day students now right and I understand that um, it's just it's frustrating for a variety of reasons because I know parents wanted to at least have the option to discuss it and and talk about the pros and cons um, so I just wanted to bring that up thank you thank you um, motion to adjourn second all those in favor six zero one two, thank you no, no. Goodness. no.